In this nursery, 20 years ago, something terrible happened. It was to change the course of magical history forever. At the hands of the most evil wizard of all time, a baby became an orphan. That baby was called Harry Potter. And this is how the story ends. Ten years ago, the Philosopher's Stone hit the big screens. It was the eagerly awaited cinematic arrival of Harry Potter. Following the huge success of the books by J.K. Rowling about the young boy wizard and his battles with unimaginable evil, no one could have predicted what would happen next, that the films themselves would go on to become part of the phenomena, watched by literally billions of people worldwide and catapulting the young stars into the stratosphere. A decade later, who could have imagined this young girl as a worldwide fashion icon and these two angel-faced boys actually shaving? Hi, I just have to be arriving. Looking very... I'm going, who's done this then? <laughs> who's been this careless? <laughs> the first take, just just kind of leaning in and then his face is going, getting closer and closer. I'll never be able to explain to anyone that I meet, knew that what my life has been like. <laughs> We have been in some incredible sets over the years on Harry Potter, and this has to be up there with the best of them. This is Gringotts, the Wizarding Bank, and we're in the Lestrange Vault. Been wondering what you did with the old gold skeleton? She's right there. Getting into Gringotts is a dangerous thing, so they naturally have to disguise themselves. Harry and Griphook, who goes along with them, go under the invisibility cloak. Ron puts on a, a, a disguise, some makeup, a beard, etc. <laughs> and uh, Hermione, if you remember the end of the last film, a hair drifted down to her uh, when she was in Malfoy Manor. And she takes that hair and she puts it in some polish juice potion and she makes, she d drinks it, though we don't see how that's done off camera, and she becomes Bellatrix. <laughs> It's a really interesting way of working because you suddenly become really aware of the things that, that I... Like, my mannerisms, yes. which I'm not really aware of. But watching Helena do me was bizarre. She's uncanny, isn't she? She's uncanny. Well, you can imagine. Hermione's Bellatrix, those are two quite different people. Yeah. And, and it's not altogether comfortable for Hermione to be Bellatrix, <laughs> to put it mildly. I wish to enter my vault. I was going to say, you're actually looking relatively... Um, demure. There's, it's well, not... I'm demure because actually I'm not Bellatrix today, I'm Hermione. This is Hermione's version of Bellatrix. It's not enough leather for my liking. No, because, you know, she's a bit... she's pure. She's, um, she's not, um... Well, Emma described her, because I've got lots of notes. In fact, we could even see them on my text. She gave me some homework for how to play Hermione. Did she? Yeah, and she said prude, you know. We were sort of compa um, comparing the two, Bellatrix and Hermione. And when I got to play her, which is my life's dream, everyone wants to play Hermione. Why not? Know? And it's great. Also, given that I am 43, to act opposite those two, because I now suddenly think, God, I'm 17 again. <laughs> Let's see if we... I've got them on my... OK, Emma, thank you for being so sweet. Oh, 
Me too. Well, definitely. I just really appreciate it. Oh, she's so nice to me. Hang on. Hang on. Hang yes, on. Hang on. We are. Have okay. We got... Then I ask for some more notes, and it's funny. I don't know where it's gone. At first, it was a bit nerve-wracking because like, she hasn't got, you know, a hump. <laughs> Emma. <laughs> or doesn't talk, you know, or, you know, doesn't have a limp or something. She's much more introverted than Bellatrix, but there's a lot of worry going on, you know. And then she does this thing with... She doesn't sometimes use her chin. Um, that's my one... You know, she's she just... She does, yeah. It's like that. Hey, Rube, how are you, you doing? doing? Good to see you. Well, I have to say, this is just quite unexpected. Right. Well, how is it? Good looking, it? Yeah, it's, it's all right. It's itchy, but does it take a while to get on. It takes about an hour. Yeah. Explain what's what's going on in this scene. This is like kind of the carts that go through all the kind of underground through the vaults and down. To yeah, get to yeah, them. yeah. So yeah, it's it's good. It's, it's quite fun on this one. It's quite a good laugh being up there on the on the rig as well. <laughs> yeah, it is actually. Yeah, it's quite good. Stuart, who designs the movies, was advising. The Orlando theme park at the time. Was he really? I don't think there was a bit of cross fertilization there. <laughs> I'm sure he came back and he said, um, and the car kind of does that and then it goes around here. And, and I said, Stuart, this sounds great. But this is like, this is like a theme park ride. <laughs> what was that, Grip Hook? And we actually you see it the when the film happens. And Rupert as well, please. To think we were right here. Love it. We've sort of seen a, a, a waterfall, and I've sensed that Warwick, or, as Grip Hook, is panicking. Grip Hook! And so we're just sort of desperately trying to work out why he is panicking, and as it turns out, it's because the, the waterfall, which we then go under, is something that removes all enchantments, so that Helena then goes back to looking like Emma. <laughs> And then all hell breaks loose. Do you know what? It just sounds like the average person trying to get a loan out of the bank at the moment. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? There's all these. That's securities. what I love about Potter. It's entirely <laughs> relatable. <laughs> Action, Sherry. Action, David. All right, here we go. <laughs> if it takes two to three people, makeup artists, to apply each of these makeups, you suddenly end up needing over 150 people. Goodness me. Just to get the makeups on in the morning. I had to bring in a load of makeup artists, um, some from Europe. I think we had 15 different nationalities all in one room. To get people who had the, you know, the relevant skills and experience to be able to put these makeups on. I'd imagine for the first time on set, you guys were the majority. The short actors were the majority, and I, I, that must have been quite, quite strange, but quite satisfying. Absolutely, yeah. There were more short people on set than, than certainly average sized cast member, if not crew members as well. Yeah, and it was it was quite lovely because it's uh, instead of see, uh, instead of sort of feeling out out of place and slightly on your own, you're suddenly surrounded by like-minded individuals and like-sized individuals, which was uh, which was really quite fun. After the break, we'll reveal how the filmmakers created the epic battle scene that will seal the fate of Harry and Lord Voldemort, and from which only one will survive. <laughs>《Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows Part 2 is primarily a war film. The gloves are well and truly off. This is an every man, woman and child fight to the death. And believe me, there is a lot of death. But it all comes to a head here at Hogwarts, a sanctuary for generations of witches and wizards. One of the best kept secrets about Harry Potter is that Hogwarts doesn't actually exist. Bits of it have been filmed all over Britain, in Durham, in York, in Annick, and parts of it have been created as sets here at Leaveston Studios. They've taken their inspiration from buildings all over the world. But you do get to see the whole Hogwarts every now and again in the film, which I always assumed was done digitally in the edit after the film had finished, but I was wrong. Just have a look at this. Hogwarts has always existed as a, as a model. There's a beautiful model at Shepperton Studios. It's huge. Mm. It's been made by all these model makers with great love and attention. 
um, we would have these three or four or five, six week shoots with this model unit filming these very intricate shots of Hogwarts. But this time we, um, we built it all digitally and that gave us much more flexibility. Another aspect was we wanted to travel through the castle in a way that we hadn't before, join things together and see more of it than we had before. So this, this has taken an awful lot of time. Um, we started um, towards the end of 2008 um, by scanning the actual real model that was built and used for previous films. We photographed all of the textures from that model. And then we, we did sort of several days of um, surveying real castles and buildings in England and Scotland, taking lots of real stone textures and architectural details, such as the windows and the leading and all of the sort of drain pipes, everything that makes a, a building look real. And then we brought all that together and spent over a year rebuilding Hogwarts in the computer and adding all the detail and texture that would allow us to basically fly the camera from a mile away from the school all the way in through a window and the resolution would actually hold up on screen. When Harry, Ron and Hermione finally return to Hogwarts, it's the beginning of the end. But whereas in the past, their arrival back at school has always been greeted with a certain amount of ceremony on trains, strange creatures and automobiles, this time they have to sneak through a secret passage to avoid detection by the Death Eaters. Now, the good news is it's connected to a pub down that end. The bad news is I've got no idea how to get down. Hey, what's up, you lot? What your surprise? Not more of before it's cooking, I hope. Be a surprise if we can digest it. Fly me. They find themselves here in the Room of Requirement, where Dumbledore's army, as you can see, have been camping out, waiting for Harry to lead them into battle against Voldemort and the Death Eaters. It just looks so different from the last time we saw it. I love it. It's kind of like the Lost Boys, you know, like yeah. there's, there's like there's hammocks and sleeping bags everywhere and radios and it's kind of like this secret gang, which is <laughs> really cool. We meet up with Neville, who's kind of like heading the DA, Dumbledore's army, while, while Harry's been gone. Lightning has struck, I repeat, right lightning has struck. What's the plan, Harry? And they all want to fight, so they all obviously, you know, this is the moment they've been waiting for. Harry's return, they're ready for action, they want to, you know, help with the cause. OK, OK, stop killing me for you, know, River. One of my favourite characters in these next two films is Matt Lewis, uh, uh, Neville. All the while, he's been a kind of bumbling... Bithering. Kind of, yeah, a bit useless and doesn't really, you know, who wants him in your army? Expelliarmus! <laughs> he leads the army this time and he really, you know, when, when Harry has his short... Um, laps and he's not there, uh, he really, you know, stands up and, and, and does one of those sort of um, brave heart speeches, you know, they may take our lives, and it's great. I was, I was getting teared up even though I was on the other side. <laughs> so, yeah, it's fantastic. It's nice to see a lot of these, again, I call them kids. We're not, none of us are kids anymore, but we're all turning into these uh, adult characters now. Men. It is men. Well said, that's the best way for it. Well, maybe not my character. He's still a bit sheepish. He's got a way to go, hasn't he? He has. Many a year. Dan, I've been on this set so many times and I've never experienced it with everybody in the hall. Yeah. It's a great atmosphere, isn't it? It is. It's a really great atmosphere. And, and tell us what exactly is going on. Um, this scene basically is the start of the battle, essentially. Um, it's Harry has... Harry sneaks into the Great Hall, and um, and I'm sort of I'm just sort of standing there being quiet, and then I reveal myself to Snape, and then we have a bit of a row, and then it, the, a huge fight breaks out between McGonagall and Alan Rickman, right. which is great, which is, with Maggie and Alan Rickman, which is great fun. At that point, you've just emerged in front of all the students, yeah, and they're all quite excited to see you because their am, hero has come back. Absolutely, it is it is the, the hero the hero enters. It, it is that it's you know, and it's a, it's a, it, it should be a really exciting. <laughs> moment, especially because I've got some great action movie lines in this scene. Give me some. Which are, um, it seems because Snape has been kind of going on about his, about how they have put exhaustive defensive strategies in place to, to stop Harry from coming in. So my line is, it seems despite your exhaustive defensive strategies, you still have a bit of a security problem, Headmaster. Turn round, doors open, cavalry comes in, turn back, and I'm afraid it's quite extensive. <laughs> it's great, you know? <laughs> You know, I won't be playing action heroes forever, and so you really have to enjoy it. When you get those kind of Indiana Jones moment The lines, big blockbuster line, great. that's not? the line you're going to live by. Absolutely. 
but then we f kind of we feel the, the you know the air gets colder and suddenly we, we feel the, or I feel it first the, the presence of Voldemort in the room, and then um, I hear Sean who's playing Maisie, uh, our young girl, um, scream. And I, I rush over to see where the scream's coming from, and then I find myself in the middle of the room. At this point, Voldemort is talking to all the students in their heads. Um, not actually in the room, but actually inside each individual student's head, giving this speech. Give me Harry Potter. I think the word he uses, no magical blood will be spilt if you give me Harry Potter. And so then the room sort of all looks around at me like, are we going to let you die? What are you waiting for? Someone grab him. I mean, this is the first time you really feel like the battle is beginning. The suits of armor come to life and they help with the attack and the ghosts and like, ev like there's this kind of unite, like all of Hogwarts comes together and against, um, against Voldemort. So it's kind of, it's a really epic, epic, epic battle. Get him, a significant chunk of the film is taken up with this epic battle. It takes place all over Hogwarts. And I've always wondered how they do it, how they take the words off the page and turn it into stuff like this. One of the most complex things about the final battle, as we began to call it, was the scale of it. So in order to prep and design the shots that David wanted, we have to do a lot of what we call pre-visualisation where we build simplified models of the environments, uh, create lots of characters and extras, and then we plan and animate large amounts of the sequences so that we can design the action and the things that we're calling virtual, which in this case was everything outside the courtyard of mm. the school. So that included hundreds of Death Eaters, the giants, the spiders, the dementors, the CG creatures. The, the process to pre-visualise such a large amount of work took over nine months. It was nearly a year's worth of work with a small team of about five people. It, it looks extravagant because we're having to animate the whole sequence, but it's basically a really useful tool for everyone to understand what's going to happen and prep and plan and then shoot the necessary elements accordingly. <laughs> Sid, tell me a little bit about what you boys are doing because um, it looks like you're making rubble. We're making rubble out, out of polystyrene blocks, um, which are fire retardant, as it happens. Um, we start off with the process of getting the sand on the bed, sifting it to make sure it doesn't have any lumps and bumps in it. And then we, we bring our rock bag up here and we dip it into dipping latex. This is called. the latex you found here? This is dipping latex. And um, this bath here takes about the biggest size you possibly can get in a block. Each side's the drain tank, and when it's ready, as it were, drained off, uh, then we bring it back to the bench and carefully coat it with, with sand. So, um, this looks like a great fun process, but why on earth are you doing it? Because, uh, it, it, on the set itself, you wouldn't be able to move a tonne of rocks just like that. But this way, a guy can move a, a, a fill a bag up and he, in theory, has a tonne of rocks. I love destroying things. Is there a part of you that gets very satisfied when you think, right, we're going to take something? I mean, how do, how do you go about dismantling this? Is it... I know you don't, this is all careful, but has someone actually got a mallet or a hammer at some point and smashed some of them down? It's not as easy. It's not <laughs> so, as easy as that. Well, but because the, these walls are not solid walls; they're just skins. They're thin plaster the skins. I mean, they're they're that thick. Um, so if you do so that, you the, just put yeah, a hole in it. Yeah, you just put a hole in it. The, the hammer would just go. So this through. isn't. So all this rubble. This is. Is this? This is the. So this is this is lightweight and manufactured by our props guys. This is what we've just seen. A little bit of the smaller stuff is real, as you can see, because it's cheaper to get real than. But the bigger stuff is that. The, the Slytherin sculpture, as you can see, is in there. And but the... this stuff, then, is all designed on the drawing board. These profiles, these broken profiles, uh, are designed on the drawing board. And then the carpenters come in and cut them into, in, into those very precise shapes according to the drawing. So, it looks so it's not just some old hammer and so So old... have I just picked up something that needs to go back exactly where Yes, please, was. yes. <laughs> the position is marked, yeah, yeah.
I'll never forget my first memory of being here really was walking through that great hall with, with everyone else before seeing the sorting hat and it was it's very bizarre. Um, so now still when you see windows smashed and things like that, you think, God, who's who's ruining our castle sort of thing? <laughs> yeah, they have. They've wrecked the Great Hall. This set's been here for nearly ten years. There's something quite sad about that. <laughs> <laughs> Does that sound really bad? Obviously, a destroyed Great Hall was stood in. I know. How are you feeling about it? I'm a little bit emotional. Emma yep. said it was a little bit satisfying, to be honest. Really? I think, yeah. All the hours you've spent in here <laughs> over the years. I know. It's not the most popular set, I have to say. Why it's not? When, whenever, whenever we film in here, it's, it's so hot. Really? And it's always really long scenes, and we've usually, it's usually filled with food that's been there for, like, a That week. you can't eat. Yeah, exactly, yeah. And so I can understand that a little bit, but, yeah, no, it's quite sad seeing it all, all smashed up, because we've kind of grown up here, yeah. so... It's odd. I mean, we just sort of just went on going, who's done this then? <laughs> who's been this careless? <laughs> but, yeah, no, it is, it's bizarre seeing it like that, but equally I wasn't that sad because about two weeks later it was redone. Ah, you so, see. So, um, magic of film. It's, it's fine, really. You get over it quite quickly. It's not like a, um, a sword and sandals where they're uh, fighting a clash of metal on metal or plastic on plastic or wood on wood. It's, um, when you're fighting with wands, actually, it's, um, it's more like orchestrating a ballet. That's all the, the, the big um, sort of battle effects are put on afterwards. Uh, John Richardson, our visual effects supervisor, you know, happily blew all kinds of things uh, apart and set fire to them and had a great time. But the, the actual, the, the, the what would be gunshots or uh, sword fights or arrows hitting, whatever they are, of course, are um, magical spells that are added afterwards. We literally made thousands and thousands of ones. I mean, the, the, obviously on. Deathly Hallows, there's big battle sequences. Sure. There. So there's hundreds of people running around with wands. So we've had to produce, you know, well over 2,000 wands just just for for the generic running around. Um, Two thousand. Yes, yeah, and then but also over the over the period of the 10 years, we've probably um, produced over 100 and I'd say 130 character wands, and then probably that multiplies because we produce at least six of each. Once we produce a wand for a character, we have to produce at least six. And if you take you know, like Daniel's wand, the Harry's wand, we've probably produced over 70, 80 of those at least because he wears them out. They, they get worn. He they, wears they them out. He's wears worn his them. wand out. He, he fiddles with them all the time, <laughs> and the paint wears off. And, and uh, so, so yeah, so it, the numbers just get bigger and bigger and bigger all the time. Of course, one of the things that's going to be important in this battle is your wand. And speaking to Pierre, who devises, creates, and makes all these extraordinary yes. props, he was telling me. A little secret. You have gone through, worn out, Daniel Macliffe, 80 ones over the last 10 years. Yes. What on earth have you been 80. doing? 80. 80. 8-0. Eight, 8-0. Zero. Eight, zero. I thought you said 8. No, no, no. 8-0. Eight, oh. You have... Wow. Not 80, not 8. You have ruined... No, no, let's not say ruined. Wow. What, what have you so been doing? I'm sorry, Pierre. <laughs> I don't know how I have managed to... to break that many wands. I know I drum with yeah. my wands a lot. Uh, sort of. So I bang them against my leg and sort of do some rhythm, you know, sort of, and that's when people say things to me like, can you drum, Dan? I said, no. He said, no, I thought not. That's <laughs> sort of the kind of time people say that to me. Um, but, yeah, so it's, I, I really don't know. I just feel very bad. You've I, not I, been sneaking I, them I off set somehow. I really haven't been. I, I'm not the person selling them on eBay, I promise. When there's so so many people in a scene and, and everyone has one, so like the whole scene now that we're doing today, all the crowd, they're all holding ones, and there's people like outside, like literally checking them in and out when they've come <laughs> off set. It's like they're all numbered and everyone has their it's one. It's like a wand check, isn't it? It's crazy. I know. They watch you like hawks. Then you're not allowed to take anything away. As I drove in today, I did see the sign saying we are doing random searches of cars. Yeah. I thought that's because they're coming to an end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, totally. I mean, I'm serious. Um, and you know, Dan, he's he's Harry Potter, and they won't let him take anything. I've just noticed, well, there's no glass in your glasses. Yeah, do do feel free to have a poke. Okay, right, yeah, um, oh, no, that's, that's, that's my Rupert. Yeah, no, these are the um, these are the lensless ones because of uh, of reflections. Oh, Sometimes nice. they see the camera in them, and so they 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 they, they have the lensless ones. Uh, this is I've, I have decided though. These are this is the one thing I want. At the end, the one thing, the, the one thing I want is the glasses, definitely. The ones with or without the lenses, though. 
without. What have I swirled away over the years? I'm sure I must have taken something. I took a piece. I took a piece from the chessboard. Oh, wow. On the first film. I mean, obviously not a huge one, say, like no, a tiny you little... You were riding those pieces. No, 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 like yeah. a cracked little okay. piece. Oh, God, do I still have it? What if I threw it away? <laughs> so will they be finding their way home to the Radcliffe? By Household. any means necessary, yes, Magic. they will. Um, I, it may be that... Uh, what was that thing I heard someone say once? It's easier to ask for forgiveness than permission, so I might just steal. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the first take, just... just <laughs> kind of leaning in and then his face is going, getting closer and closer. So Harry's tearing around Hogwarts, desperately trying to find the Grey Lady, because he's hoping she's going to point him in the direction of one of the last Horcruxes. And this entire set has been constructed specifically for this scene, which is going to end up being really short. It's just incredible. <laughs> Harry! <laughs> These girls are going to kill me, Harry. So... They're like running through Hogwarts, going down to the Chamber of Secrets, climbing down, going down into the dungeon, all scary, dark, ugh, creepy, and uh, get into the Chamber of Secrets, and um, they go and they 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 get the Fang, and um, Hermione destroys the Horcrux. They've killed this Horcrux. They've nearly died doing it. They might die in the next ten minutes out in the battle. They've just got to snog. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. It's, it's not just the snog. No. no, 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 no. No, no. It's like it's a... Like a, it's like a you are the love of my life kind of moment. I don't know. It was just... I don't want to say we were just dreading it, but it was just... It wasn't something I was really kind of looking for. It was, we knew it was going to be a kind of awkward moment. Well, I don't know who kisses who. They just... It just happens. It just happens? It just happens in this... Yeah. Magical way. I mean, the first take, just, just kind of leaning in, and then his face is going, getting closer and closer. It just, it was, it was quite weird. It, it didn't really feel right, but <laughs> it was cause just, just cause I've known her for just sure. so long, really. When we went for the first take, she just, she just made up her mind that right, let's just do this properly, and so she, um, she just grabbed Rupert and went for it. We both went and tried to go in really quickly and get it done really quickly. <laughs> both actually kind of. Bashed faces of it a bit too much, but I think that's the one he actually is going to use in the end. So it was, yeah, it was, it, yeah, it was fine. It was, it wasn't actually as bad as I kind of built it up in my head. So yeah. Is she a good kisser? The um, nation need to know. The world needs to know. I actually have no memory, <laughs> no memory at all. I've kind of, I must have kind of wiped it out. My but yeah, you're a true was... gentleman. <laughs> clearly, you're very discreet. Yeah. You weren't supposed to do the four yet, but that was. So they're coming to the end of the battle. One of the great challenges for the actors at this stage is that they're fighting things that they can't even see. The battle scenes have been amazing, yeah. There's some great, great scenes in the courtyard where just, it's just basically all the Death Eaters against kind of the students. And it's just a massive, like, real epic. Kind of epic. Yeah, it's great. You know, the giants and the, the spiders. And aren't the, the animated... Um, the, the festivals and the, 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 your festivals, your statues, your ghosts. Your statues that come to life, and your ghosts. Stay, stay. Kill the snake. We have to kill the snake. Ah. 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 Did you get the snake? I, I, I have now said that is that that line or variants of that line is all I say for the last forty-five minutes. <laughs> That's essentially okay. what I do. Kill the snake! We've got to kill the snake! We have to kill the snake! It's all, you know, it's all very much about the snake. And are you uh, going to get it right at some point so we can all go to lunch? Um, um, could you... That's a good question. <laughs> Although, you are only coming here for the day, you are a guest, a little bit of a call. But the battle's it's coming towards the climax, which they're shooting out there. 
and um, Neville's been through the wars since day one. I mean, he's had the whole year at school. He's just been beaten and tortured by the Death Eaters. I mean, all these are sort of supposed to be old, older wounds. So they've just a build-up of wounds. Yeah, yeah, over the year, um, where he's you know, stood up for Dumbledore and what's right, and he's paid the price for it, really. Uh, whereas this one, this one's a new one. This happens in the, in the, and, the, and the burns as well. Look at the burns. This is from uh, the, the, the bridge scene, where uh, Neville has to try and halt the advancing Death Eaters and they plant some charges on the bridge, a bit like a bridge too far. Right. Um, and uh, he's on the bridge when it goes, when it goes down. Yeah. And then he's just been, again, a bit more. Uh, Voldemort's just fired him through uh, with a spell, and he's come 50 yards into here, across all this rubble, and landed somewhere over there. Down that on way. On all those beds over there. And, and he stretches the land up. Yeah, exactly. Is it a comfortable fall? I think that's how he survived, with the stretchers. Okay. So he got up and... Why um, have they got, in, in the world of magic and, and wonderful craziness, why have they got Second World War mattresses? I can't answer that. No. I'm afraid I can't answer that. I but at know. least you survived. But yes, we survived. Yeah, so we're OK. And um, he gets up and then stumbles out, out here for the climax of the battle. I've seen you waving a sword about. And I, the I wish sword a... of Gryffindor. Look, look, look. Here it is. This is the sword keeper. Yeah. Here we go. This is the side of Godric Griffin. Can I have a can feel? Do, yeah, go for it. Ooh, that's, that's got a nice weight to it. It's pretty cool, isn't it? So do you get given sort of, like, um, sword fighting lessons? We had a few. We had a few, like... Can you give me a tip? To, how to, am um, I holding it correctly? Is this... You're holding it fine, I guess. Okay. I mean... Uh, I'm from I... Essex, so I have a, oh, right, you know, okay. some <laughs> right. history with sword fighting. <laughs> OK, right. Well, I guess the main thing is, is to have a very sort of a firm grip on the sword for a start. Right. And then you, you, you block it. When it's blocked, we're blocking spells. Yeah. We're actually sword fighting. OK, so it's a bit so like... So it has to be a very, sort of, a very extravagant sort of Go on, show sweep. Me, you know. what, we do, what we've been doing is sort of when we're blocking the spells, it's very sort of Value. all the way up like that and, then, and then blocking them away. Really sort of... It's almost like a sliced backhand exactly, on a table exactly, tennis table. Exactly, yeah, But yeah, with yeah, the sword. Slicing it that way. Talk me through what you're doing, because you and uh, Rupert seem to be doing a lot of rolling around in the rubble. We are. Well, you see, we're being chased by a giant snake. Ah, oh, right. We've been watching a lot yeah. of attempts to kill this snake today. <laughs> we have. We keep failing. And, and, and Ron's stuck under you, so he doesn't, <laughs> he doesn't get to be the hero. Hang on, no. Oh. We, we fall down together and he, he protects me and holds me in a loving embrace as we're about to die. <laughs> Well, it's quite a tight space where we have to fall in, and we have to be holding hands as well. And we have to kind of fall, kind of romantically as well. So. <laughs> See, is that was that a stage direction? Was, yeah. Was he really? Well, yeah. She's got to kind of nestle into me, and, <laughs> and it's, it's, yeah, it's quite cool. But so, is that something that you you coordinate with Emma? Like, right, let's. This is how we're going to nestle. This is how we're going to do it full romantically. Yeah, because this is kind of this is after the kiss, all this stuff. So we're kind of a couple now. It's not quite there yet, but. Um... This was my addition, the what? sexy cut lip. Hold on. Did that something you did or something you asked for? <laughs> that was something that I asked for. Um, so you looked at it, so you thought, I, I've got to have... I was like, if we're going to do this whole epic, you know... Beaten up. Beaten up thing, I want a cut lip. And you've got a great graze on your neck as well. well oh, that's not is... love bite or something, is it? No. <laughs> Ron's been in That would have been awkward. And... No, <laughs> um, this, is, uh, this is from Bellatrix. She tries to slit my throat, actually. She's good like that, isn't she? Yeah, she's pretty mean. Um, yeah. I still find it incredible, though, because looking at you... And I'm, I'm stood, you know... Very close a, a, to me. And it still looks so real, so the, I know, the it, scar on your neck or the cut on your lip. It's amazing. funny, because I forget. I wear it all day, and then I catch myself in the mirror, and I'm like, God, I look terrible. <laughs> I look really bad. Um, no, but it's fun. It's, it's fun. Yeah, I'm well. Well So, Amanda, what are you going to do to me? So, we're going to make you battle-worn. Oh, OK. So we're going to give you... We have all these little pieces here that we've made up. So this would be like a hit that you could have had a punch underneath the eye. It could have been some falling debris. There's so many places that people could have got wounded in this battle. Um, majority probably from falling debris, from spells that the Death Eaters are putting on the castle. OK. So we have a whole pizza box here of an pizza. array <laughs> of um, different... I didn't know pizza delivery did this sort of <laughs> thing. Bondo wounds. Yeah. It keeps them flat. Um, so there's all sorts of different scrapes and grazes and things that we put Gosh, on, and then we can colour them. Um, and then, you know, then you can go out there and get covered in all the dirt. See, the thing about the cuts, though, is, I bet, I mean, they must be sort of great fun to have on. They love them for the first bit, 
and they all want the biggest cuts and the biggest wounds <laughs> and there's always a battle going on of who's got the best cut and then that's fine for the first week and after that when they're in long makeups like Neville gets really badly and he's he's in makeup for quite a long time and he's lost interest has he yeah and now he wishes that he'd gone for something smaller and <laughs> So it sounds that it's a good idea at the time and there's a big sort of, lots of scar envy goes on. Who's got the best scar? There's a moral in there, isn't there? Yeah. <laughs> Be careful so what you is, wish for. Yeah, exactly. In Kid Star's top trumps, we're worth nothing. Nothing. I don't know, I guess I'm in denial. Tell you what, you should see the other fella. It's nearly the end for Harry, Voldemort, the good, the bad and the ugly who populate the world created by J.K. Rowling in that cafe at the end of the last millennium, which means it's nearly the end for us too. What's that been like, watching them grow up? Well, it's extraordinary and they've great. It's been lovely and a bit of a shock. You suddenly go, you know, like, Rupert suddenly talking like this. And <laughs> I remember Christopher Columbus saying he'd just been up in the cutting room and they'd been in, done the invisibility cloak bit and Rupert had gone in talking like this. And then, of course, they'd shocked when he came out months later and he'd come out talking like this. <laughs> <laughs> so they had to... He'd gone through puberty gone. under the cloak. He had! An amazing thing happens in Harry Potter. I know! Lots of people would like to go through puberty yeah, under so a cloak, easy, wouldn't they? <laughs> it's such a difficult time. But so, when you see sort of clips from, like, the first one, um, the Philosopher's Stone, they're just so cute, aren't they? I'd forgotten they were like that. And now, they're, yes, they're young men and young women. You can't help but feel maternal. I'm seeing them grow up and thinking they're going out into the world now. It's like, it feels like that. You know, you feel sort of to protect them and a bit. So there's yeah, a bit of, of that feeling. I'd never say that to them. No. No, don't tell anyone. No, no, no. But, um... <laughs> From the very beginning, Dan, Rupert and I have been made aware that I almost feel like we were ticking bombs that the public just expected, expected, you know, as you said, about this time, you know, around now, they'll be losing it. But I think it's a number of different things. I think it's the English film industry is very different from Hollywood. Um, and I think this particular environment, the fact that we've had, you know, a solid base, leaves and studios, it's, we've just been incredibly sheltered. We're not part of a, of a bigger film industry scene or Hollywood or celebrity thing. We, we're here every day and we're working and we're working really hard. None of you have been into rehab. No. None of you have sort of, you know, no. had, had sort of huge imagined breakups no. in the press. And oh, stuff in like Kid Star's top trumps, we're worth nothing. Nothing. No nothing. points whatsoever. Nothing. And I am quite a boring person. I enjoy being at home and watching TV. The thing is, I like parties and I like all that stuff as much as anyone else does. But uh, when it comes to the work, it's work, and it's yeah. the work that I like. I suppose we're always quite busy, really. I mean, we don't get a lot of time to really go too off the rails. But, I don't know, there's still, there's still time. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think that sort of you're ever gonna get over being in Harry Potter? Do you think you'll ever sort of be able to leave it behind and say, right, that's done now? I'm not sure. Everyone keeps asking me now, like, wow, it must be incredible, and all oh, the memories and stuff, and you, you don't think of it. I don't know whether something to do about my age, but at this point in my life, I don't really look back at it that much and think, wow, that was, you know... I, I guess, to put it in perspective, is very hard to do at my age. Uh, I don't have anything to compare it to, either. You don't remember that much of your life before you were 10 years old. I mean, obviously, I've got a few memories, but... Sure, sure, sure. My life pretty much... My memory started work pretty much around 10 or 11, and that's how long I've been here for, so it's kind of all I know. Can you buy a pint of milk without people saying, oh, hello? Well, yeah, I mean, it's pretty much constant, and it's kind of everywhere, but... It's not everyone's always really positive, it's just I've never really seen it as kind of something to really hide away from. It's always been... Yeah, I've, I, don't, I remember once when um, I was in America... Uh, I think I was in America somewhere and someone wanted a photo with me. And I, went to, I put my arm around her and she told me not to touch her. <laughs> <laughs> so that was, that was probably the only... <laughs> only kind of bad experience. She asked for your photo and then yeah. said, don't touch me? That's what you do, isn't it? When you I would have thought so. But, How yeah, she didn't want it. So, <laughs> that told you. Do you ever think, do you ever look back and think oh, you've missed out on anything? Factually speaking, I have missed out on certain things that 
other people who have gone to school every day have missed out on. You, you know, I mean, in, uh, I mean, I've missed. Uh, there, are, of course, there's moments I've missed that I've, I will have missed. I don't know the first week at university and how yeah. that must feel, and I'm sure it feels incredible and amazing. But I've had parallel experiences, though not the same, and the kind of are of the same nature because we all sort of go through the same stuff it's just what prompts us to go through it that sort of changes i think mm. and so yeah i mean i don't feel like I've, in terms of have i not done stuff that a lot of other people have done then yes that's that is absolutely undeniably true but at the same time i've done a lot of stuff that other people will never get a chance to do and i you know so it's you, you know for everything i've missed i've also gained something else i'm very lucky that i've managed to retain at the same school I went to. Mm. Still, it wasn't easy leaving the school for a month and coming back with blonde hair and blonde eyebrows, you know. I, I, I would never say that I was bullied, only because I, I have a very, you know, I don't consider name calling. I didn't take it as bullying anyway. It's more just a, a combination of, um, yeah, banter and, 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 and jealousy, as well as, you know, general people assuming that you're going to be someone very arrogant because you're in a, uh, in a film. And yeah, lots of school trips. I'll never forget, you know, that was a really sad part of it, that you'd, you'd book these school trips up and then they'd say, uh, oh, I'm going, you know, I'm going skiing at the Alps next week. You go, you're going, what, skiing? <laughs> I don't think so, no skiing for you. And it's like, ah, that sucks. And looking back at it now, of course I'm not, re uh, I don't regret, you don't regret a thing, but equally, um, it's not that easy when you're, when you're a youngster. I think it's been a very kind of unique way of kind of growing up, really. The other day, we, they gave us a DVD of um, our first screen test together. No. It really, yeah, it was really weird, because I was really cockney. Nicholas Flamel is the only known maker of the Sorcerer's Stone. The, the what? what? I was really surprised. I was really, really strong cockney accent. And, but it's kind of over the years, I guess, it's, I've toned it down. It's <laughs> been bled out of yeah. you. But, um, yeah, but, yeah, it was really weird, because they, they, they showed another potential run as well. Oh. Which is quite weird. And he was really good as well. No! I would have... I probably would have cast him. <laughs> it doesn't really feel real that it really is coming to an end. It's really strange. I can't really describe it. I keep feeling like... I don't know. I guess I'm in denial. In this courtyard here, they're setting up for what will become the climax of this epic battle scene. You're going to have the good guys on one side, the dark forces on the other, and they're going to come together, and it's all going to kick off. But what we know is that some of our favourite characters might not make it through. Oh, come on, Tom. Let's finish this the way we started it. Together! The film will kind of should leave everybody with kind of the resting heartbeat of about 160 beats per minute. You know, I mean, it certainly feels like it when we're filming it, not sure. to be disparaging, but feels kind of relentless. You know, yeah. it's everything is always happening, and it's a, a battle to the scale of which we've never seen in this world before. Uh, it's, yeah, I mean, it's, it's the, way, the way a film series should end. <laughs> Do you think we'll ever just have a quiet year at Hogwarts? No. no. There must be a very special bond between you and Dan and Rupert, a bond that only the three of you can really understand, because right back from that first experience, the first day you turn up and you play in these characters, and that first premiere, the three of you have always been there. You've been there next to each other, so you know what it's like on the inside, mm. being Harry, Hermione yeah. and Ron. Yeah. And that, that must be something very unique. Yeah, it... Um, I have moments where I feel quite isolated by the uniqueness of my life experience. You know, I'll be... I, I'll never be able to explain to anyone that I meet new that what my life has been like or what it's all like, really. You kind of have to be in it. So they, they are the only two other people in the world who I don't have to explain myself and they just... They just know. They've just they've done everything with me, and um, that the, that bond that we have. Um, I think even more than it is to us now. I feel like when this is over, our friendship will have a new importance for the three of us. Um, because I think when it's over, we'll need each other more than we do, do even now. Really. I'm Harry. Harry Potter. If you could look back to ten-year-old Dan, who's just about to embark on this journey. 
What would you say to him um, to prepare him? Have a good time. I don't know what else would I say. Um, I mean, is there I an essence that like... you'd sort of go, you know, don't get too carried away with it, don't, don't believe the hype, you know? Or, or... I don't think I, I don't think I'd tell myself anything that I, that the ten-year-old me didn't hadn't already sort of had. I was very unfazed by it all. Like I didn't, mm. I didn't believe the hype, and I didn't get too swept up by it. And and I always had fun, and I didn't, you know. And it, it, so I don't know if there's anything I would say to him. Well, that sounds awfully smug, but I, I and you know, I, I think any of the mistakes that I've made that I could give myself clues to when I'm ten, I wouldn't because there is essential that I make them, mm. and and they've absolutely formed a huge part of the person that I am along with everything else in my life. So, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, I'd just probably tell him to not eat the food in the Great Hall after the third day of a scene. <laughs> So, seven books, eight films, and more than ten years later, it's all come to an end. Only I can live forever. To be able to come to this extraordinary film set for the last five years, to snoop behind the scenes, to get to play with the props and to meet the stars has been truly magical. And even though it's going to be weird without it, because it's been such a huge part of all our lives for such a long time, I reckon that magic is going to linger on.